So we've got uh, an amazing amount of new developments to share with you that I think are incredibly exciting, as well as tell you about the future of what we're planning to do here. The overarching goal of Neuralink is to create a ultimately a whole brain interface, a generalized input-output device that in the long term literally could interface with every aspect of your brain, and in the short term can interface with any given section of, of your brain and, and uh, solve a tremendous number of things that cause de debilitating issues for people. So we are uh, all already cyborgs in a way, in that the, your, your phone and your computer are extensions of yourself. And if you, I'm sure you found, like if you leave your phone behind, uh, you, you find, end up tapping your pockets and, and it's like having missing limb syndrome. Leaving your phone behind is kind of like a missing limb at this point. You're so used to interfacing with it. You're so, so used to being a, a de facto cyborg. So what's the limitation on, on, a, on a phone or a, a laptop? The limitation is the, the rate at which you can receive and send information, especially the, 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 the speed with which you can send information. So if you're interacting with a phone, it's limited by the speed at which you can move your thumbs. Uh, or the speed at which you can talk into your phone. This is an extremely low data rate. You know, maybe it's like 10, optimistically 100 bits per second, but a computer can, can communicate at gigabits, ter terabits per second. So Justin Roiland in the audience. Uh, this is a, hi, Justin. So it's a little Rick and Morty reference here. Great Rick and Morty episode about intelligence enhancement of your dog, and what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> this video is now 18 months old. So this is um, Pager. Uh, who is playing monkey mind pong. So this is, Pager has a neural link implant in this video. And th the thing that's interesting is that you, you, can't, you can't even see the, the neural implant. We've miniaturized the neural implant to the po point where it, it matches the, the thickness of the skull that is removed. So it's essentially the, it's sort of like having an Apple Watch or a Fitbit, re re replacing a piece of skull with like a, you know, a smartwatch. <laughs> Pedro first learned to play Pong with, with a joystick, so I'm like, that was novel. It's like, I didn't know monkeys could play Pong, but they can. And we took the joystick away and have the, the neural link. Telepathic video games, essentially. So what we've been doing since then is we've been on the, the very difficult journey from prototype to product. But we've been working hard to be ready for our first human, and obviously be, we want to be extremely careful and certain that, that it will work well before putting a device in a human. But we're, we've submitted, I think, most of our paperwork to the FDA, and we're, we're probably in about six months. We should be able to have our first neural link in a human. So <laughs> We do everything we possibly can to test the devices before, not even going into a human, before even going into uh, an animal. So we do benchtop testing. We do accelerated, accelerated life testing. Uh, we have uh, a fake brain simulator uh, that has the, the texture and it's like emulating a brain but it's sort of rubber. We do everything we possibly can with rigorous bench top, bench top testing. So we're not cavalier in putting devices into animals. Since the Pager demo, uh, we've expanded to work with a troop of six monkeys. We've actually upgraded Pager. They do varied tasks and we do everything possible to ensure that, that things are stable and rec replicable and that, things la that the device lasts for a long time without degradation. What you're seeing there is it looks like the matrix, but that, that's uh, actually, th th that's a real output of, of neural signals. That's, that's not a simulation or a, just a screensaver or something. That those are actual Neurons firing. Uh, Sake, that's one of our other monkeys, uh, typing on a keyboard. What's really cool here is, is um, Sake, the monkey, is moving the mouse cursor using just his mind. It's also important to show that um, Sake actually likes doing the demo <laughs> and is not like strapped to the chair or anything. <laughs> so uh, it, it's the monkeys actually enjoy doing the demos, because they, and, and they get the banana smoothie, and it's kind of a fun game. The, the first two applications we're gonna aim for in humans um, are restoring uh, vision. This is like notable in that even if someone has never had vision ever, like they were born blind, uh, we're, we believe they can, they, they can, we can still restore vision. The other application being in the motor cortex, uh, where we would initially enable someone who has no Ability, to, almost no ability to operate their their muscles. You know, sort of like a sort of Stephen Hawking type situation, and um, enable them to operate their phone faster than someone who has hand, working hands.
I mean, as miraculous as it may sound, uh, we're confident that it is possible to restore full body functionality to someone who has a severed spinal cord. I want to emphasize again that the primary purpose of this update is recruiting. Um, if there's one message I want to convey, it is that if you have expertise in creating advanced uh, devices like watches and phones, computers, uh, then your, your capabilities uh, would be of great use in solving uh, these important problems. So our first steps along these dimensions for our device is what we call the N1 implant. It's a size of, of about a quarter, and it has over 1,000 channels that are capable of recording and stimulating. Uh, Microfabricated on a flexible thin film arrays that we call threads. It's fully implantable and wireless, so no wires, and after the surgery, uh, the, the implant is under the skin and it is invisible. It also has a battery that you can charge wirelessly and you can use it at home. So similarly, for implanting our device safely into the brain, we built a surgical robot that we call the R1 robot. So here it is. That's our R1 robot with our patient alpha who is lying comfortably on the patient bed. This is what we call the targeting view. So what you're seeing is this is a picture of our uh, brain proxy. And the pink represents the cortical surface that we want to insert our electrodes into. And the black represents the vasculatures that we want to avoid. So this is another view real quick. Uh, on the left is the uh, view of the insertion area. And on the right, uh, what the robot's going to do is it's going to peel the array, uh, the, the threads, one by one from its silicon backing and insert it into the targets that we uh, predetermined in the targeting view. There you go. That's the first insertion. It's quite accurate, but it's a bit slower than what we would like. And Kersen Control is the foundation for interacting with most computer applications. So since then, we've been working to improve Kersen's speed and accuracy. As you can see, it's much, much faster. Almost twice as fast. Woo! So we are working and we are designing a <laughs> mouse and keyboard interfaces for the brain. The way we do that is by training Pedro and, Pedro and his friends on a variety of computer tasks, and then designing algorithms to predict their behavior. Here you can see a few examples of tasks in different phases of monkey training. For example, left and right click, click and drag, cursor typing, swipe typing, handwriting, and even hand gestures. I like when I click on a button and I can physically feel the button being pressed. When a potential N1 user will attempt to click, they won't be able to feel it. An example of how we are uh, addressing that is by providing a real-time visual feedback that represents the strength of the neural click by changing the color of the cursor. Just by typing on a physical keyboard is much faster and easier than typing on an iPad keyboard. This will make the brain control much faster and easier to use. We start this project with our monkeys, but of course they don't know how to write. So to mimic writing, we train Ranger, one of our favorite monkeys, to trace digits on an iPad. Here you can see him tracing the digit five and the digit two. Then we recorded his neural activity with the N1 device. But now, instead of decoding the cursor velocity, we decode in real time the digit that he's tracing on the screen. The second one, that although it can increase the typing rate, it requires hundreds of examples and samples of each of the digits and the characters we wanted to classify. This would not scale. The way we are solving that is by indirection. Instead of decoding directly the digits, we first decode the hand trajectory of the uh, on the screen. And then, when we decode the hand trajectory, we can use any off-the-shelf handwriting classifier to predict the digit and the characters. For example, classifiers that are trained on an MNIST dataset. Why it's so important? It's important because now we can potentially decode any character in any language with only one neural decoder for hand trajectory. It means that you can write in English, Hebrew, Mandarin, or even monkey language, and we can understand you wanted a banana. Here's what we want that experience to feel like. In this video, you can see Saki walking over to his MacBook and choosing to work on his typing task. The entire decoding system works out of the box, and it feels totally plug and play. The first step to achieving this kind of high reliability is to test extensively offline 
A typical flow for using the N1 link is to connect over Bluetooth, stream out neural activity from the brain, and then use that neural activity to train decoders and do real-time inference. We've built a simulation for exactly this sequence, but instead of using a monkey with an implant, we use a simulated brain that injects synthetic neural activity into an implant sitting in a server rack. From the point of view of that implant, it's in a real brain. Here on the right, you can see that this bias is making it hard for the cursor to move to the upper right corner. You see it struggling here to make it up to the upper right, and then it moves much more effortlessly down to the bottom left. We're trying many approaches to mitigate this problem. Some examples include building models on large data sets of many days of data to try to find patterns in, of neural activity that are stable across days. Another approach we're trying is to continuously sample statistics of neural activity on the implant and use the latest estimates to pre-process the data before feeding it into the model. Over the last year, we've made tremendous improvements to the stability and reliability of our system. And we've been able to demonstrate consistent high performance across many sessions and many months. We designed the custom neural sensors, which include both analog and digital circuitry, to record and stimulate across 1,024 independent channels. We face challenges across all three major metrics, performance, power, and area. Not only do we have to fit all 1024 channels into a single quarter-sized implant, but we also have to measure spiking activity less than 20 microvolts in amplitude. And today, I'd like to focus on the last challenge I mentioned, power. Power consumption is important to us because we want to give future users a full day of use of their implant without any interruption for charging. Back in 2018, we were sending every sample from every channel off the device for processing, which burned a ton of power. In 2020, we brought spike detection onto the chip. As you may know, neurons transmit information by firing. So simply monitoring for these spikes and only sending these spike events off the implant acts as a very efficient form of compression. And over the past two years, we've continued to make optimizations within the ASIC dropping the total system power consumption down to just 32 milliwatts and doubling battery life. Let's take a look at our on-chip spike detection algorithm, which makes our battery-powered implants possible. We first start by applying a 500 hertz to 5 kilohertz bandpass filter to remove noise that's out of band. Next, we use an estimate of the noise floor to generate an adaptive threshold per channel. And finally, our spike detector module identifies three key points of a spike. Identifying three points allows us to detect not just the presence of a uh, spike, but the shape of a spike as well. This can be extremely important for distinguishing between multiple neurons adjacent to a single channel. Today, I'd like to focus on one of the many optimizations that we've made in our latest chip, this one specifically cutting system power by 15%. In our latest chip, we split the state into two parts, a hot state and a cold state. The hot state is accessed on every cycle, while the cold state is only accessed once the threshold is crossed, reducing the average access width and saving power. This is a view of the insertion site, similar to the one that DJ showed you earlier. But instead of the targeting reticles, if you look closely, you can see that all 64 threads, each carrying 16 electrodes, have been inserted into the brain proxy while avoiding vasculature, and all just within the past 20 minutes. In pursuit of these goals, our charging system has gone through several engineering iterations. The first, uh, if you watched our pig demo in August of 2020, Gertrude was implanted with a version of the N1 charged with our first generation charger. This device was implemented in a small puck package and later separated into a remote coil and battery base. This charger was challenging to use. However, we learned a lot through its implementation. Uh, with the addition of one new outer control loop plus a banana smoothie pump, uh, the troop has been trained to charge themselves. So let's see how Pager charges his implant. On the right, we're streaming real-time diagnostics from Pager's N1. When he climbs up and sits below the coil, you can see the charger automatically detect his presence and transition from searching to charging. We see the regulated power output on a scale of zero to one, and the current driven into his battery. So when we started building implants, in our original implementation of these systems, we used off-the-shelf components to start automating tests quickly. However, these systems were constructed in a relatively artisan fashion and were very difficult to maintain. 
And this meant that testing quickly became the bottleneck for development. So to alleviate this, the hardware and software teams developed a new system which integrates all the required components onto a single baseboard. We can then put the charger and implant hardware on individual modules that plug into this baseboard, including one board with opposing coils so that we can test charging performance. This architecture allows us to rapidly iterate different hardware prototypes because we can simply drop them into this system and reuse all the testing infrastructure. Additionally, we can host the current and next generation of our neural ASICs onto FPGAs and plug those into this board as well. And that allows us to test a whole extra layer altogether. So that's how we generated this rather inceptive image here on the right. What you're looking at is spiking activity emitted from some of our simulated neural sensors, streamed through the entire system over Bluetooth, and then displayed on a phone. This allows us to test everything in one system from chip to cloud. This system is one-fifth the cost, one-fifth the volume, and is very easy to manufacture. This allows every developer to have a personal unit on their desk, and it also allows us to test, uh, to shard the entire test suite over a large number of these units mounted into a rack. All of this has greatly accelerated our rate of development. In our original implementation of doing these impedance scans, it took four hours to get through all 1,000 channels. We're now able to scan all 1,000 channels in just 20 seconds. This means that we can run impedance on every implant every day. And then our internal dashboards can play back a history of this impedance so that we can get a really good quantitative insight into that interface between biology and electronics. As you can see, our internal humidity sensing is so sensitive, it can even detect the very small and slow humidity rise just from diffusion through our implant materials. Now, in blue, you can see that same internal humidity data, but from devices in our accelerated system. Now, if we adjust this data for our acceleration factor, you can begin to see not only the agreement in this data, but also just how far into the future this data extends. Now, in red, you can see a device which has failed in our accelerated system. This device showed an abnormal increase in humidity over the duration of many months before implant electronic failures occurred. Well, we started building the first system prototype just after the COVID shutdown had begun in early 2020. So we had to get a little creative. As you can see, our first system prototype was a little scrappy and operated out of one of our apartments, as indicated by the carpeting. Over the duration of just a few months, the system was built out totally custom and highly iterated with two system versions and countless minor iterations, leading us to our currently operated third generation system, which achieves high density testing with automatic in-vessel charging, as well as automatic data collection. We also integrated the system into a high density rack mount form factor, along with a centralized fluid management system, both for chemical uniformity across vessels and also reduced operational maintenance. The system has been in operation for the last year and a half and has had its fair share of challenges. Since the system itself, well, we have started work on our fourth generation system and have totally redesigned it from the ground up to be a hot swappable single implant per vessel design, partly inspired by high density compute servers. With this new system, we will achieve a whole new level of density, robustness, and scale. So the way that the team solved this is by putting all three of these optical paths into one optical stack using photon magic or polarization, whatever you want to call it. And that enables us to do uh, vessel avoidance in real time. So as I mentioned, the brain is moving. And where we place targets in the beginning may not be where you want to insert at the moment the needle is going down there. So the robot can actually detect the vessels and then determine if we're going to insert onto a vessel or not, if it's safe to insert. And then that way we can avoid inserting onto major vessels. And that brings us to the robot that we have here today. Our current custom optical systems offer pretty incredible capabilities for imaging the exposed brain surface. Once the dura is in place, you can't see the dense vasculature at the brain surface. The dura is in the way. There's simply too much attenuation. To solve this problem, we're developing a new optical system that uses medical standard fluorescent dye to image vessels underneath the tissue. We're also exploring applying our laser imaging system to deeper tissue structures. Um, this is a real life SEM image of our latest design. Uh, on the left there, you can see the end of the thread. In the middle is the needle, and on the light is actually a piece of my hair. Um, so yeah, it's extremely small. Um, and besides being really small, there's a lot of other challenges associated with designing this. One challenge is that we have to use the needle and the ca protective cannula that it sits in to grab onto the thread and to hold it while we peel it from this protective silicon backing. And then we have to keep holding it while we bring it over to the surface and then release it from the cannula during insertions. 
Another challenge is that we don't just have to get the needle through, we have to get the thread through as well. Uh, so we really have to focus on optimizing the combined profile of the needle and thread together. And these are just some of the challenges associated with designing something like this. This allows us to iterate in under an hour for new designs. The latest design, seen on the right, can actually insert through nine layers of Dura, totaling uh, three millimeters on the bench top. This is far more than we could ever expect in a human with significant margin. We're developing synthetic materials that mimic the biological environment. This allows us to learn as much as we can on Benchtop and start taking steps away from the industry standard of animal testing. Developing accurate proxies, though, is challenging. We've come a long way from our humble first brain proxy, shown here sitting on a plate and consisting of agar and a parafilm sheet. And while simple, it allowed us to perfect robot insertions through countless Benchtop tests. Today, our proxy is slightly more complex, where we've upgraded to a composite hydrogel-based brain proxy that better mimics the modulus of real human brain. In this image, I've highlighted the calcarine sulcus in red in an MRI. It contains a map of the visual world, the visual field. It's about the surface area equal to a credit card on each side. And if you unfold it and flatten it, you see that the image is inverted. It's upside down. But more interestingly, it's, mag it's distorted so that the central part of the visual field, the fixation point, is greatly magnified. So for example, if you look at this image of Lincoln, if you look directly into his right eye, everything to the left of that fixation point is directed to your right visual cortex, and everything to the, l to the right goes to your left visual cortex. His eye, even though it's very small in the image, is magnified in the brain to occupy nearly a, a quarter of the surface area of the visual cortex. We've inserted our device into the visual cortex of two rhesus monkeys, whose names are Code and Dash. That means we can record activity from their visual cortex generated by their, nor their normal home environment as they roam around. But as we all know, monkeys love banana smoothie. That means we can easily teach them to fixate points on a screen and reward them. We can reward them very precisely because we can track the location of their eye using an infrared camera. And if we take all these receptive fields and accumulate them together, overlap them, and place them on a, on a computer monitor for scale at a typical viewing distance, you begin to get an idea of how much of the visual field we can cover with this preliminary device. Let's look at code performing this task. I want to show you first at one quarter speed, uh, there's a visual flash, and he makes an eye movement towards it. We, the monkey can only see what is white on this screen. He can't see his own eye movement, and he can't, certainly can't see when we stimulate. But here we stimulate, and he makes the same saccade to the same location because we stimulated the same electrode. Nothing appears on the screen at that time, and he has no other cue to make that eye movement. This is a schematic of what a visual prosthesis using our N1 device, device might look like. A camera, the output from a camera, would be processed by an iPhone, for example, which would then stream the data to the device, and the image would be converted into a pattern of stimulation of the electrodes into visual cortex. You've already heard about how we can use the N1 link as a communication prosthesis to help someone with spinal cord injury control a computer or a phone, but it can also be used to reanimate the body. Let me show you how. First, a little neuroanatomy. Movement and tensions arise in motor cortex and are sent down long nerve fibers through the spinal cord. These are upper motor neurons. In the spinal cord, they synapse, that is, make a connection with another mo motor neuron, a lower motor neuron, which sends these movement and tensions to the muscles, which contract, and in turn, you have movement. This pig has a more than one Neuralink device. There's a device in the brain, but there's also one in the spinal cord. And we can stream neural data from this device, these devices, in real time and use them to do things like decode the movement of the joints of the pig. So here you can see on the left a time series of the hip, knee, and ankle, and we're decoding uh, those, those movements. Uh, and as before, you can see we're able to track the position of the joints and also stream neural data as well. OK, so let's stimulate an electrode. So here's one electrode on one thread that when we stimulate causes a flexion movement of the leg. So on the left, you can see the movement of the joints, and you can also see the time series of the stimulation pattern in yellow. So the leg is moving up. Here's another electrode, which when we stimulate, causes an extensor movement. 
This is actually a little harder to see because the leg is straightening and the hips are shifting. But if you look carefully, you can see how uh, this is, uh, the, the leg is moving. 